Quick history lesson here. On October 30th, 1938, Orson Welles, at that time a radio personality with a show in New York, took the H.G. Wells novel War of the Worlds and presented it as if it were a live news broadcast, adding subtle touches of realism like long periods of dead air and reporters tripping over their own words as they try to describe the beginnings of an alien invasion. They reported that the invaders just leveled a random town called Grover's Mill, New Jersey. The problem was, everyone bought it. When all of a sudden the executive in charge walks up to you and said, listen, my God, you're sharing people to, to, to death. Please, uh, interrupt. Tell them it's only a show. And Orson said, what do you mean, interrupt? No way. They're scared? Good. They're supposed to be scared. Now let me finish. Panic gripped the nation as people scrambled to ready themselves for the imminent invasion. I remember my mother wanting to call on the telephone. Her father and her sisters lived in New York, and she couldn't get through. The lines were busy. She just wanted a call to say goodbye. It was absolutely bedlam. It was bedlam. It was revealed to be a hoax the next day, but the damage had already been done. The only positive that came out of the whole ordeal was that it led to Citizen Kane, a little-known movie that isn't discussed nearly as much as it should be. Then, of course, they passed a lot of laws. Now you can't do it. You can't give a news broadcast, say, this is the news without all that. Mm. But the people who tried it in other countries were all put in jail. <laughs> and I got a contract. Hollywood. With that said, it's almost Halloween in Arnold's city of whatever it's called, and the members of the boarding house are doling out who's going to be what non copywritten character this year. Things like witches and samurai, but Ernie and Mr. Wynn fight over who's going to be Frankenstein, which is a minor thing that bugs me. He's not called Frankenstein, he's just known as the monster. Calling him Frankenstein would be like saying this is Zelda, or this is Jaws, or that this is a decent president. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the other side of their nameless town, Bob Pataki, Mr. Green the Butcher, and Harvey the Mailman, three people we've never seen hanging out together before or since, are playing cards and watching the show UFO Tonight, hosted by Douglas Kane. <coughs> Basically a show where the host sits in a leather chair and talks about aliens while moving as little as possible in order to save money on the budget. Loop that footage to your heart's content, hey Arnold animators. Yes, rosebud frozen peas, full of country goodness and green penis. Wait, that's terrible. I quit. But the whole talk of visitors gets Bob on a roll about his own alleged abduction, going so far as to say that his aliens look like the ones depicted on the show. Although I think that maybe Bob was just dozing off one night while watching that Star Trek episode, The Menagerie, and thought it was really happening. His story gives Helga the idea for everyone to dress up and stage an invasion, but we see that things never change as the kids lobby to be able to wear any other non-trademark costume as well. Things like pirates and vikings. No ninja turtles, no power rangers, and no Disney princesses. How about clowns? Just clowns. But Arnold and Gerald have a plan of their own that actually works out for everyone. They're going to put on a radio drama about an impending alien assault for the unsuspecting boarders. The other kids could show up in full costume to complete the illusion. The night finally arrives and Helga is all ready to go. But before leaving, she has the audacity to bother her dad with the burden of acknowledging his daughter. I mean, come on, he's right in the middle of his newspaper. At the same time back at the boarding house, we see that it's one of those parties where the background characters don't move. They're just stuck in poses and tend to get the point across that something lively is happening, yet not lively enough to be animated about it. But on the rooftop, Arnold and Gerald are setting up for the broadcast, and it appears that they've used that little cartoon magic of connecting incompatible audio formats by just laying random cables behind the equipment. Oh, and gramophones can be used backwards if you just speak into them too. It's finally showtime as the rest of the kids arrive, and it's at this point that my suspension of disbelief is totally broken. You mean to tell me that a dozen kids left to their own devices to make an alien costume arrived at identical results? Have you ever seen the bulletin board in a fourth grade classroom? Kids can't even agree on what Santa looks like and that's just from drawings. But unbeknownst to Arnold and Gerald, one of Kane's assistants just so happens to catch wind of the invasion by tuning to station 104.U. He arrives with camera in hand just in time for the kids to ring the doorbell and bring the prank full circle. But Ernie is having none of it. He's ready to bash some skulls in with his mallet. Now there's one last piece of the plan and it's left as stinky. He strings up a bunch of lights to the only water tower that luckily can be seen by any vantage point in town. So once the word gets out the aliens have landed on Wells Ridge, <coughs> full scale panic erupts which triggers Bob to go into gorilla mode and take matters into his own hands. So he recruits his two best part time friends and, to round out the rough edges, a third aging out of shape balding man, Principal Warts. A couple hours ago, three men who have never interacted before were thrown together in a sloppy attempt to give Bob someone to talk to. The two other men survive as soldiers of the customer service industry. Also, there's Principal Warts. If you have an alien invasion on your hands, and no one else can help, and if you can find them, and if there isn't any snow around, I hate the snow. I hate the snow. Then you can hire the lame team. 
This is the time when I think Warts is at his best because a lot of us probably knew an educator just like him. A rigid authoritarian when they're in charge at school, but you can just tell that they're a wet sponge when alone in a group with their peers. As if he had any credibility left after he went through that disco phase. Anyway, the kids get cornered and no one believes that it's a hoax. They find out that Harold bought permanent exterior latex because they were going to be out all night, so there's no way that that makeup is coming off. Then it's off to the rendezvous point at the fake mothership, which is where Bob and the rest of the fat pack are camped out and cobbling explosives together out of beepers and egg timers. MacGyver levels here, and all Harvey has to do is wait for the signal. As the rest of the town converges on the landing site, Bob springs into action and grabs Helga by her alien brain that's suspiciously jiggly considering that it's a pot on her head. They try to convince him it's a costume, but he refuses to believe it. Then he gives a signal more blatant than the one in Airplane. Hey Larry, where's the forklift? So the beeper bomb is launched and destroys the obvious, rooted into the ground, how can you not tell what that is, especially up close, water tower. That in turn douses the kids with water, but they're wearing permanent exterior latex, so... Damn it, hey Arnold, your lack of logic made a liar out of me. Unless it was acid in there, I suppose. Then we get a bit of mixed messages as I think they all end up applauding the fact that Bob is a monster. I almost killed my own daughter! I'm a monster! Yeah! Unless it was a, hey, the crisis has been resolved kind of applause. I'll never do a prank like that again. Ah, oh, what are you talking about? You terrified the entire city and nearly caused the end of the world? Oh, I'm proud of you, boy. Yeah, have some candy. Oh. Turns out Arnold's grandma has been off on her own adventure and she managed to return power to the city. Now everybody can finally all hold hands on the subway. Then Pookie scales a recently damaged and completely unsafe structure in order to rewire the lights. Lights that won't be worth much come the next day, you know, November 1st. They'll just be left up there until Valentine's Day like everybody else does. I can assure you that Douglas Kane is a big, pompous windbag. Let's all go home and get some sleep. What do you say? Did you get that? All in all, it's a pretty decent episode, and definitely a yearly watch for me. It's so decent that I feel compelled to put it into a haiku. Arnold and Gerald, two kids with oddly shaped heads, stage an invasion. Not original, but the prank is tried and true. People fall for it. Despite common sense, paranoia wins again. This is the sad truth. Some things never change. Dumb people are gullible. Till the end of time. Till the end of time. Good God, it will never stop. Till the end of time. <laughs>